Welcome to Noble Warrior. My name is CK Lin. This is a place where visionaries talk about mindset and consciousness hacking as a way to create a life, an organization of impact and purpose. So if you're a high performer looking to do the same, you came to the right place. I'm really excited to share my next guest with you. He is the Chief Impact Officer of the Rodale Institute. He's really made it his mission to reconnect humans with the earth and to elevate a connection between our soul and the soil. In this interview, we talked about the seed of his passion towards food. We talked about the health crises he experienced a few years ago and how he was able to climb out of those darker moments in the specific rituals that he did as a way to cultivate his body, his mind, his heart and spirit to get out of that space to a better spot. We talked about the small steps that you can take to cultivate your relationship with the soil. From the most direct, to the intermediate, and to the least direct. If you truly want to be the healthiest and most actualized version of yourself, pay attention to what Jeff have to say about the relationship between our capacity to our nutrients. Please enjoy my conversation with Jeff Thatch. Thank you so much, CK. It's an honor and a privilege to be here with you today. Thank you for being here, Jeff. I'm actually really excited and for a couple of reasons. One, because I'm on my own path to discover my relationship with food, with my farmers, with the ecosystem and ultimately climate change. And frankly speaking, definitely not quite there yet. Intellectually, I'm all there, but in practice, I'm not there yet. So as someone who is a chief impact officer, I have a lot to learn from you. So thanks for being here. Cool. Let's dive in. Yeah. So why don't we actually do just a little bit of a recap? Because one thing I noticed your story from my research that you've been on this hero's path, hero's journey for healing. You started this path and very young about food. And then you started again, or it was a pivotal moment again, a few years ago as you are dealing with your health challenges. Can you share with us, how did you ask these deep questions at such a young age? Yeah, yeah. Wow, it's, it's actually, it's, a, it's an emotional experience to, to journey back there with you. Growing up here in eastern Pennsylvania, about an hour north of Philadelphia as a young child, I was really unhealthy. Uh, starting around the age of three or four, I, from the furthest memories that I possibly have, I remember being sick all the time and like going back and forth to the same doctor starting around the ages of three or four. My mom would take me to the doctor and I just remember the doctor being a very compassionate person and really doing all that he could to help me. But really what he would ultimately do was prescribe all kinds of medicines. And the symptoms that were emerging were like asthma, allergies, all of which led to things like obesity and just this general feeling of lethargy and malaise that was just set in from a young age. And I lived like that for many years from about the age of four until about the age of 13. And around the age of 13, I think I was in early eighth grade and sustained an injury. I tried to go out to, I tried to go out to play sports thinking that maybe if I threw myself at sports, then I would get healthy, right? Become fit. And about six weeks into the football season, I sustained an injury that completely debilitated me. I broke my ankle oh, straight man. through. Yeah, straight through two places, compound fracture. Oh, man. I, I had to get surgery, brought, brought the, the short season to an end. And then I ended up like on the couch for six weeks. Wasn't able to go to school, was laid up with crutches and a cast. And I, I was at like the lowest point I ever felt. Like, I, for, again, from the ages of four to 13, were, they, were not, they were not pretty. They're, they're, I remember thinking back and just feeling generally down about myself a lot through that season of my life, but that was like the lowest moment. And I decided like, enough, I am not gonna live this way anymore. And I remember very specifically saying, hey mom, do me a favor. Next time you go to the grocery store, I want you to buy me a copy of a magazine called Men's Health. I had just seen an ad on TV back in the early 90s remember they used to do those infomercials for magazines and men's health appeared on the screen so i asked my mom to buy me a copy of men's health 
and she brought it home. And I remember I read it like cover to cover 10 times. And, and then I remember I wrote down like all these groceries. I'm like, all right, mom, here's next time you go back to the store, do me a favor, buy me everything that's on this list. Cause I'm going to start eating. I thought to myself, okay, if I'm laid up on this couch for the next six weeks, I'm going to get to work. What can I do to start moving my life in a better direction? And I had this mo this epiphany moment, which was like, it's food. You can control what you eat. And if you put good food into your body, guess what? It's going to speed the healing process. It's going to change your mood. It's going to change your mindset. And then when you can get off these crutches, then you'll be much more ready to exercise. So that was really like uh, the introductory moment that I think if I think back on it, it was maybe the the first real pivotal moment of my life that set me on the course that I'm on today. So pause for a moment because thinking back when I was 13, I don't think about the quality of my food. I just thought about the taste of my food, maybe the composition at best and protein so I can get muscles and things like that versus sure. quality. And also there are other options. Hey, exercise so I can gain muscles and attract the girls or whatever. So men's health, that's essentially what you read. Why food all of all other things that the magazines cover? I think at that moment, it's because I couldn't do anything else. I thought the only thing I can control, the only thing that was in my control was that which I put on my plate. And I, I also intuitively know, I, I think it was a gift from spirit that there was something intuitive in my mind as a 13 year old that said what I had been eating starting at the ages of four to the ages of 13 was likely contributing to my unhealth. I just mm -hmm. had this intuition. It was like a gut feeling. Like, okay. All the medicines I've been taking, all of the crappy food that I've been putting in my body have had to be the reason, the catalyst for the way that I feel and look. And so if I change those things, if I began to embrace nourishing foods, whole foods, real food, it's got to bring me back to life. It had to. I just had this intuition. Mm, mm, mm. So the uh, minor point, but I think an important one, you live with your family at that time, 13, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And then uh, chances are you didn't cook yourself. You had to cons persuade your mom or whoever to cook for you and in living in relationship in a positive or synergistic relationship with others, how were you able to persuade them again at a young age to buy more better ingredient, but probably a little bit more expensive, a little bit harder to find, a little bit harder to, to come by. And then also make the change lifestyle, dietary or cooking habits such that you can fulfill your goals. Does that make sense? Complete sense. Yeah. And not to mention, I grew up in a Italian with an Italian mother where food was like a religious experience. And so now mm -hmm. all of a sudden I'm saying, Hey mom, you know what, everything that you've been feeding me, can you stop? Um, or could you guys, could you maybe make what you're making for the rest of the family? But I want to eat this over here. And so that in and of itself was like a cultural disruption in our household, for sure. Right. Totally. So how were you able to do that? Um, I mean, I'm, I'm also asking this question very specifically because Chinese family, food is a religious experience. Mom loves to cook. This is her craft. This is her currency of love. And then I'm saying no. And there's a little bit of how can you? deny my currency of love to you. So I'm curious to know how you navigated that. And I think for people who are listening, because if you want to make a change, there are also other people in your life. So I'm asking this question also for them as well. Yeah. I think my mom saw the desperation in my eyes where she said, wait a minute, we've been trying to inspire our son to get healthy. I remember as a kid through that period of four to 13, mom and dad were pushing me to go out for the swim team or for the tennis team or to just try to find some athletic outlet thinking that that would be the catalyst to get me on a better path but i think that if anything that that i had a bit of a confidence issue because i wasn't good at sports and because i didn't feel good how was i ever going to be an athlete and so when she finally saw me take the reins and say 
this is what I want to do. I want to focus on nutrition. She said, okay, let's give him a shot. Let's get, let's feed that part of him. What's really interesting is my father turned 40 around that same year. Uh, I think it was literally the same year and my dad raising three boys, the stress of all that. He started to add a little weight around the waistline around age 40. He had sustained an injury several years prior, so he hadn't been working out. But no kidding, like six months into the whole my whole journey, my dad says, "Hey, I'm gonna buy a, I'm gonna buy some gym equipment for the basement. And by the way, I'm gonna start eating like Jeff too." And mm. little by little, we saw this sort of transformation of the whole family. I actually haven't talked about this before, so it's the first time I'm actually building that association. But my sort of convictions around this ended up becoming a catalyst for my parents to embrace it for themselves. You, cool. you were an early change maker, even for your family. <laughs> I love that. Yeah. It's true. It's the rippling effect, right? Once you make a decision, you're clear about your path, you commit to it, and it ripples out to other people, family, Confucius said, self, family, country, world. And essentially, that's what you did, self, mm -hmm. family, and then you're working on making that impact in the world as a chief impact officer. <laughs> So could you, so it's one thing to make a lifestyle shift. It's another to really dedicate your life to it. And if you, if I look at everything that you've done, there's that trend line of this is your path. Can you share with us about how you were able to follow this trajectory through and through? Yeah. It, and it was exactly that. Did you ever hear the saying? follow the thread. Mm -hmm. Have you ever heard that, that phrase? It, I've been doing a lot of self-reflection this year in 2020 on my own life and doing a lot of journaling and just thinking back. And I'm about to share a story with you that I just recently remembered and shared with my mother and my wife. But prior to that, I haven't shared this with anybody. But so my injury happened in eighth grade. Okay. Mm -hmm. I remembered something that happened, I think around the age of sixth or seventh grade that also was part of the thread. And in, I had this amazing science teacher around that age. I think it was sixth grade, maybe seventh grade. Mrs. Mounta was her name. And she was like a force. She was like the best teacher and was just inspiring young children to embrace science. And as such, she invited every student in the class to enter the, the Pennsylvania Junior Academy of Science Awards. And I think every student had to, part, had to at least attempt to submit a project. And then there would be a panel of people, I think teachers that would vote on finalists. And then a couple finalists from each class would go to a regional um, competition. And then the regional competition um, would progress to an, a, a statewide competition. And so I entered and I thought back on what that early research project was, and I chose to do a biology experiment where we were taking plants. I forget the type of plant it was, but it was one plant grown in four different soil types. Mm. And over the course of an eight week period, you had to track how these different soil types had an impact on the health of the plant and mm -hmm. the plant's ability to grow. And so I, 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 I had this whole plant and this whole experiment. I think one plant was grown in potting soil. Another plant was grown in sand. Another plant was grown hydroponically just using water. And then I think the third plant was a mixture of outdoor soil mixed with potting soil mixed with sand or something like that. And would you believe I, I won the competition regionally and then I got invited to go to the state competition at Penn State University and won a scholarship, like a small scholarship. But who would have ever thought that 30 years later, I'd be running a global institution that studies soil health, but it just dawned on me that, that may have been the first thread, you know? Yeah. I, I, when those moments happens, when the dots connect in the aha moment, oh my God, I've been on this path all along. And meanwhile, I've been searching everywhere else, but actually looking back in the rear room mirror. So what was it like for you when that moment happened? When I discovered that? When I yeah, when you discovered the association, like, oh my God, I'd be on this same path all along. 
Yeah, I. Oh gosh, it was like blinders came off. I'm like, wait a minute. I like that was a key. I was like, oh my god, I forgot about the like maybe the most important piece of the story started all the way back there. I didn't. I didn't. We, we're going to talk more about my journey, but I didn't study science in college. The first 16 years of work outside of college was focused in the media and publishing industry. It had nothing to do with science. But was there something here that just kept pulling me to, to follow the thread? I, I think so. And I think I'm now beginning to discover and see that as, a, as if I'm seeing it for the first time in my life. How I know I'm following my thread is how much joy I get in spite of the difficulties, the challenging times, the ridiculousness or the pettiness, whatever. And that I still enjoy whatever it is that I do. So that's how I know, like I'm on my path. I'm curious to know having identify the past as well as the, the present, how can you advise your younger self to really follow that thread a little bit better? Yeah. I think the, the, the two most important words I would tell that younger self would be to slow down. I, I have always found myself to be an overachiever, um, very driven towards my own success, whatever that, however you define that. And I, I, looking back over the adult years of my life specifically, and probably the young adult years of my life too. The best years of my life have always been the years where I slowed down. Slowed down to give myself space to think, to listen, to reflect, and to be inspired. And the, and, and the worst years of my life historically have always been years where I tried to take on too much, do too much, achieve too much. And so much so that ultimately drove me to a major collapse, health collapse four years ago that set me on the path that I'm on today, which I'm sure we'll get to unpack on the show, but that would be the advice I give to myself would be to slow down. So before we get to the collapse in very important moments, I wanted you to underline sort of the metacognition aspect of it, because you're speaking mm -hmm. to an audience of overachievers, chances are, <laughs> and then what they hear from their inner voice the parents or their culture or even their community is go faster is better. More is better. Filling up your entire calendar is better. Sure. You gotta keep a productivity galore 24 seven. And so then the advice of hearing slowing down, like, yeah, intellectually, I get it. But I gotta go. So it's neither don't do anything. It's neither fill up everything, every single second of your calendar with something. In my mind, I'm, I'm a believer of the middle path, right? The middle way. So I'm curious to know how you navigated giving yourself space at the same time, be as ambitious, as impactful as you want to be. Yeah. First, I had to learn the hard way. And that's when my life came to a screeching halt and I fell bedridden for three months with a very chronic illness. But then since then, and I, and since I've slowly climbed out of that health collapse, what I've had to do on a day-to-day moment-to-moment -moment basis is build in rhythms and rest. You have to, it's, it becomes part of your daily discipline, part of your daily doing where you become very intentional about specific moments in the day where you do slow down, where you do that work of non-doing. And I know that on the days when I take that time and make that a priority, that the best of my life emerges from those moments. Was it the famous mystic and monk Thomas Merton who said, like he, he called it like, it was this whole idea of action and contemplation, like action comes out of contemplation, but it has mm. to start there. It starts with contemplation first. Mm. And then that was later adopted by this Franciscan priest, Father Richard Rohr, who actually runs the Center for Action and Con Contemplation down in 
Albuquerque, New Mexico. And it's this whole idea of people like people that are wired like you and me need to remind ourselves that the very best of us lies in those moments of contemplation, of rest, of reflection. And the action should only come out of those moments. You should never force the action from a, a, another place of action. Does that make sense? Mm, it, it totally does. I, whenever I make a decision out of being hurried, mm -hmm. chances are it's never a good one. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Chances are it's never a good one. Actually, so for me, one of the tools that I got recently is the aura ring. I don't know if you could see it here. Oh, I've been seeing those in I would love to learn more about the aura ring. I've heard that it's awesome. Yeah. So qualitatively, I knew that my sleep has suffered a lot recently. And so I wanted to quantify it, right? As a scientific person, I like to play with numbers. I like to gamify it. So I got an aura ring just as a forcing function for me to, to see where I'm at and how I can tweak it and do scientific experiments on myself on how I can basically up the score better. And it's been, it's only been a few days, but it's been good so far for me. So I just wrote that down. I'm actually, I think it's time I look into one. Yeah. So I'll share a couple of things and why I like it. One is, is minimum profile. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't bother me. I don't need to think about putting on a band or a watch or some kind of a wearables. So it, it lasts for a long time. It, it looks pretty cool. That doesn't hurt. Sure. And, 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 and it's one of those things for me, I like a forcing function once I do it and I can just forget about it. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then it has a mobile app. It tells you that, Hey, it's time to move. It gives you some like a caloric intake on your goals. It's more than just a sleep tracker, even though that's what I want. It's also for me an activities tracker as well. It, it, and it, one thing that's really cool for me, an accidental discovery is as an athlete, resting heart rate, it's something that I always want to know, like what is my resting heart rate when I'm sleeping? So this also allows me to track that. Yeah. What do you like to do physically? I, from a fitness perspective, I'm just curious where you're at. Yeah, for sure. By the way, when I did a research on you, I saw that you're an avid CrossFitter. Are you still uh, CrossFitting or? Uh, no? that, that, that's funny. I was actually an early adopter of CrossFit. I was really into it about ten years ago. I got certified to teach and to train. Oh no and, kidding! Yeah, yeah. So love it, but I've I evolved away from that. But now I've found myself coming back to it in a new way. I'm actually really into this modality called Animal Flow. Mm -hmm. um, so animal flow is a hybrid of yoga, capoeira, jujitsu, and I have a, a trainer that I see once a week and she's a badass and just really love that style of work of working out where it's really just using sort of natural movement. But no, yeah. I think CrossFit was definitely foundational to my fitness regime at one point. And I still borrow and draw on that. So like you, I try CrossFit as well, but as a competitive person. I just find myself being too competitive and hurt myself very easily. <laughs> so after two, three times of trying it, I'm like, oh my God, CrossFit is just not good for me. Because I don't want to be slower than someone who's like a grandma, right? right. So I try to like go faster, go harder. And then the grandma is just taking her time and making it easy. Anyway, point being, CrossFit is awesome if you can be disciplined about pushing yourself but not injuring yourself. But I'm not that person. So for me, I'm more of a body movement type person that, yeah. that, that I really enjoy that. I, so in terms of my physical rituals today, it's run mm -hmm. and then I do a regular Tabata, nice. whether it be sprinting or shadow boxing, right. And then I'll basically run back. So it's pretty is easy simple nothing too complicated Perfect. and I also do a 50 50 every day so 50 push-ups 50 crunches you know nice. I, may, I may add something else just change up the the flavor yeah very cool very cool yeah and what about you animal flow, everyday animal flow uh, yeah i'd say no. i've got like a routine that's lasts from morning till the time i go to bed and first thing in the morning it's uh 
usually a, about a 20 minute combination of yoga, core work, core strengthening and animal flow with maybe some kettlebells. So that's just opens me up, loosens my body. And first thing um, in the morning, first thing gives me energy. I wow. use extra, and then from that, I transition into a, about a 10 to 20 minute breath work session. I'm usually up about a full hour before my wife gets up and it's just like a routine we have in our house that works really well for us. And that first sort of hour of my day, that's the foundation to everything else I do. And then later on in the day, usually either over the lunch hour or after work, I go out for either an hour bicycle. I'm into like bike riding, like mountain biking, road cycling, or gravel. Like I have a couple of different bike choices. And mm -hmm. here in Pennsylvania, I can get to single track mountain bike trails pretty easy or beautiful country roads to go ride a bike. So I'll do either an hour bike ride or the animal flow movement session a couple nights a week. And then every couple weeks, I can sneak down to the beach. So the Jersey Shore is about two hours door to door from where I live. And I took up surfing three years ago, which has been a major catalyst in my healing. Mm -hmm. There's just something about being in the ocean for me. And I'm not a great surfer. I'm some days I threat with coming away from being from going from beginner to intermediate. I'm somewhere on that edge, but just as soon as I feel like I'm about to bust into the intermediate surfing bracket, then a, a really big set of waves come and, and then I get humbled again. But I love surfing. I just find it to be one of the most profound experiences you know, I've ever had. So that's the mix. It's, it's, it's movement, core strength, cycling, walking, and then surfing. Yeah, no, it's beautiful. I want to unpack a few things. Sure. So number one, you seem to really enjoy it Two, the, you see yourself as an athlete, right? Mm -hmm. And three, you have variety, you mm -hmm. have options. So then yeah. depending on your mood or whatever you have, you, you don't have to just stick with one thing and four, they're pretty much all outdoors, right? So you don't quite just stay in the gym a person. So I want to ask you about the question of why the outdoors, like why is being in nature, being in that movement important for you? Yeah. Yeah. And by the way, even the core work and the yoga, like on from spring through fall, if I can be outside, I'm out on my, my back deck doing that work. So yeah, there is absolutely something about being in nature that in some ways is as much of a priority as the exercise itself. I find just like you, I rely on tech to do most of my work. So I'm on screens all day and I really need that separation. I need that, the breathing, the sounds, the sights, the smells, the feeling of being in nature and the movement itself to me are the combination. It's not one or the other, it's both. Mm. My wife thinks I'm nuts, but I have no problem going for a bicycle ride in January in Pennsylvania. 30 degree day, you have the right clothing, the right gear. It's, I'm not looking to win, but I don't race bikes. I don't compete. I used to do that. But to me, it's the elements, the rhythms and the breathing. It's all of it. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. A major metropolitan area so it's a little bit harder i used to live in uh, topanga or pacific palace yeah, yeah. California, around that area so it's pretty easy to get to the pacific ocean but these days a little bit harder so uh, you're in san, san francisco i oh, know uh i'm in orange county yeah socal right. so yeah mm -hmm. and so there's that trade-off, right? I want to be in nature, but at the same time, I like my convenience. We're going to get into that particular component when it comes to food in a moment. Mm -hmm. But accessing nature is super important. I didn't appreciate it when I was younger. My dad used to really just love us to, to take us to the highest mountain of Taiwan and just overlook the ocean and the mountain. And in my younger mind, I'm like, this is so boring. <laughs> why, why nature? But as I get older, I'm like, holy shit, there's so much the energetic transmission, the relaxation of the mind. 
and the air you breathe and just expands my internal space so much. Nature is it's true adaptogen, right? Yeah. If you're stressed, it calms you down. If you're not stressed, if you need a little bit more inspiration, it amps you up. So it's great. Do you ever practice Qigong by chance? I looked into it. Actually, one of the previous guests is a world champion of push hand. Really? Yeah, yeah. I looked into it. Uh, to me, it's all about finding the right teacher. Yeah. In any kind of discipline that I learn. So I've yet to find the right teacher with the mastery of the skills as well as the right resonance as well as the yeah. teaching style. So those are yeah. really hard to find for me. Yeah, I just found, I just, again, when I was really sick and not able to physically do much because of being so sick, I discovered Qigong. I found a woman and she actually taught me virtually. She taught me through Zoom like this. Mm. And, uh, and then I be, later, about a year later, I, be, I met who is now one of my best friends and he too is a Qigong master and has taught me a lot. So a lot of times if I can't do anything else, like I just mentioned all that I'd love to do, but if a certain day just doesn't present itself with the ability to do any of those other modalities, I'll just go outside and practice Qigong for 10 minutes and 15 minutes. And it's powerful just to be mm -hmm. able to breathe and move and connect breath with movement in nature. It's incredible. So you mentioned breath work a few times. I know you're really passionate about breath work. Share, share with us your love for breath work. Yeah. Why this particular practice domain, you sure. know, uh, all that. Yeah. Um, well, let's see. I want to hesitate how I respond because I don't want to un open a can of, uh, of, of worms that, well, maybe I do, but we're going to get into my health collapse. And oh, right. We can go back yeah. to the health collapse and come yeah, back to breath work. Sure. Let, let's talk about breath work first, and then we'll go to my health collapse, and then back to breath work. But sure. uh, what I was ultimately diagnosed with when I, my health fell apart was chronic Lyme disease. So I went about six, seven months undiagnosed. And then when I finally found myself to the right doctor who was able to do the right diagnostics and he found what he found, okay, I, now I knew what I was dealing with. And one of the many side effects was this feeling of this sensation of shortness of breath. Mm. And this, this went on for months, if not over a year where a perfectly fit guy, I used to be at the top of my athletic game, competitive athlete, and then I fall completely bedridden, couldn't do anything. There was days when I couldn't even walk to the mailbox to get the mail. I was that sick. Mm. And then as I slowly crawled out of that, one of the lingering symptoms was the sensation of breathlessness, which I later found was, was a, a symptom of, of chronic Lyme disease. It impacts your mitochondria and your mitochondrial function. Mm. And you're actually not starved for oxygen, but you're, you think you are. And so I found my way through. So I was a very committed meditation practitioner at the time. And this is about two years ago. And then I started on this path that led me to Wim Hof method and other ancient forms of breath work. But, and I started experimenting with all kinds of different forms of breath work, Wim Hof and a combination of Wim Hof and some other techniques are really what I do on a daily basis. But about two months into daily practice, that symptom went away. And I have never had the symptom again since I started practicing. So that That's sensation amazing. of breathlessness is just gone. Just gone. Amazing. There's a whole, let's see. I do want to get back to, yeah, why don't we talk about the health collapse? And then we're going to come back to breath work in a bit and we can go really deep in the breath work part, if you don't mind. Sure. No, not at all. Yeah. But how did you come about the, this health collapse? Mm -hmm. Like, how did you discover it? Was it, and then why don't you actually focus on not just, Hey, I, I, I had a health problem. I saw a doctor and got prescribed, like more of a describing it. If you can go into the experience of it, the dark part of it, like the emotion aspect of it. I think it's really important to, to discuss that because I don't think just people say enough about their dark moments. So if you can go into that a bit, I think it would be really helpful for those who may be in their dark moments now. Yeah. I have no, it would be my honor to do that. Up until about, 
October of 2016, I had been working in a leadership, you can even say senior leadership capacity in the media industry. So graduating college, full circle, talk about following the thread. Coming out of college, I graduated with a degree in marketing. And, but at the same time, I always, through my teen years, I held this passion for health and wellness because of what I experienced in my childhood. And through my college years, I was not sure about, okay, what do I want to do? What, what am I going to do? Like I had this sort of yearning for marrying together my business degree in marketing with my passion for health and wellness. But I was struggling with what would that look like? How could I connect those dots? And in, during college, I was um, dating a girl who was from Eastern Pennsylvania, and she was a year older than me and had really good grades. She graduated a year before me and, and landed a job teaching at a private school, like a really prestigious private school that was in Pennsylvania near her home and near my home. And, you know, we had this conversation that I remember going something like, that's all well, you know, that's great. I fully support you and, you know, your ambitions to go start teaching here, but I really want to go pursue health and wellness. And I think that's probably going to take me out West somewhere. Cause that's where the health and wellness industry was like based, like Boulder, Colorado was just this town that was in my mind. And she's, I'm not leaving here. Like I have a job. This is where my family is. So I thought, okay, I really, I like this girl. I, I want to give it a go. So someone said, well, you should consider Rodale. And someone's, and I said, what's Rodale? And they said, oh, it's this health and wellness publishing company. They're like a global health and wellness publishing company. They're based over in this little town, not too far from here, but yet they publish products. She's like, this person said, you may even know one of their magazines is called Men's Health Magazine. Mm. I'm like, what? Men's Health is published by Rodale in Pennsylvania, not too far from where I'm standing right now? She's like, yeah, that's right. She's like, check it out. So I went on, this would have been around spring of 2001. I went onto the website. I'm like, okay. it was like this whole world opened. I'm like, wait a minute. The whole, and if you read about the Rodale story, and I hope to share with you, like the history of that company is started by this one man who his name is J.I. Rodale. And he's widely known as the pioneer of the whole organic food movement in North America. He started a magazine in 1942 called Organic Gardening Magazine, and then built a whole health and wellness publishing company on that one product. And I was like, this is a dream come true. If I could figure out a way to get a job there, that would be everything. And mm. so thus begun the journey. I ended up like applying through the traditional channels. I didn't know anyone there. So I just applied to the HR department and landed a job, like an entry level marketing job for Men's Health Magazine in September of 2001. I ended up spending 13 amazing years working in publishing for Rodale and became the publisher and managing director of several of the products. And then in 2013, I got recruited away from Rodale to a competitive company a company that competes with Rodale called Active Interest Media. They're based in Boulder, Colorado. So again, it's like this whole thread just began to connect. And I thought, well, now's my chance to move out West and go experience the world in another place. So I moved out there and spent three years. My, uh, my then fiance and I moved together and we got married and we called that our three-year honeymoon. I was the managing director of Yoga Journal Magazine and some other health and wellness products. And I ultimately wasn't really fulfilled in that work. I just, I missed the mission, the sense of mission, the sense of purpose that I found in Rodale. I missed the family orientation that company had. And lo and behold, I get a call from the third generation CEO of the company, Maria Rodale. And she called me around the end of 2015 and invited me back to basically have a very senior position. I was going to be the senior vice president over an entire division of Rodale Incorporated. The media industry was starting to really fall on challenging times around that year. At that point, Google and Facebook were taking about 70 cents market share of every dollar spent on media and advertising. So publishers like Rodale were just struggling to stay relevant. 
And my job was to come back and try to lead that company through a very challenging time. And I think, have you ever heard this whole idea of like the loyal soldier, this sort of idea that many men in particular struggle with this complex that we're meant to fix everything and so that we are somehow superhuman and that we can somehow take on the world. And that was the mindset I had around this. Not, it was subtle. I didn't really, I didn't lead with this idea. It was coming from a very humble place, but I think deep down at the center of my being, my soul probably felt like maybe, yeah, maybe Jeff, you are the one that could save this. And, and so I went back to Pennsylvania and within the first year, I, it was the hardest job I ever signed up for. It was, I was on and off airplanes all the time. I never saw my wife. I was taking on a $40 million turnaround and a $4 million startup. So I, I oversaw two products and sorry, I didn't understand 40 million turnaround and a $4 million startup. What does that mean? Yeah. Yeah. So I actually was, I had two jobs. I was the senior vice president and managing director of prevention, the prevention brand, which was a magazine and a whole business line of products that was worth about, it was about a $40 million division inside of Rodale. So that was struggling and frankly, it was losing money. And my job was to make it profitable again. And then the $4 million startup was another magazine and brand that the company started called Organic Life. And my job was to help put that brand into orbit and to get that profitable. So that was my job. And about a year into it, the first nine months were going really well. And then about nine months into the whole ordeal, I got sick, like just mysteriously ill. Like it was like a fall day, just like today, beautiful day. And I got, I fell ill and it was started with as a cold and then the cold progressed into fever and then the fever progressed into full on flu like symptoms. And about three days into it, I'm like, I should probably go to the doctor. I went to the doctor. I didn't really have a good doctor because I was a pretty healthy guy. So I went to a family doctor at the hospital. He did a whole evaluation on me, did a bunch of blood work, found nothing at all. And then said, focus on bed rest. You probably just have a fall flu or a fall cold so, or a virus. So that was like about 10, 12 days into it. I'm still not getting better. Kept going back, calling the doctor's office, explaining, hey, I'm, I'm sick. Like, guys, I'm really sick. Can someone please help me? And they're like, we're doing everything we can for you. Just focus on getting better. And so I took a week off of work. Finally, I forced myself to go back to work. Like the fever broke. And then I just wasn't right. And from about the end of October through the end of the year, like December, I would get just well enough to get back to work only to fall ill again. And it was like this process over about 12 weeks. It was the same cycle. And finally, December 27th of 2016, I went back to that doctor one final time. And I said, doc, I'm still not better. You got to help me. There's something seriously wrong. And he looked at me and he said, the only thing that I can do for you is offer you a prescription to an anti-anxiety and an antidepressant. Because at that point I was having like panic attacks. Like I was scared to death. And he's like, beyond that, Jeff, we've sent you to four specialists. There's nothing wrong with you. You're overworked, you're burned out. And the whole cause of your health collapse is that you took on, you, that you're trying to push yourself beyond your limits. So now it's January. He said, I'll, I'll tell you what, I'll write a medical uh, doctor's note to send you on medical leave that will allow you to, to get paid on disability. So talk about humility. I went from being this top performer, this high performing athlete, this business executive to bedridden on the couch and no answers as to what caused that health collapse. So now about four, five, six weeks into being at home on medical leave, a good friend said, you might want to consider finding yourself to what's called a functional medicine doctor. So before you go to the solution part, if you can describe what that experience is like, and actually what practices helped you through those dark moments, because some people may be in their dark moments right now, they may need to find their source of purpose or inspiration to continue forward. In especially for entrepreneurs, right? During COVID, their business may have tanked and now are looking to reinvent themselves as a new person. 
if you can contextualize what the emotional experience is doing those dark night of the soul moments, that would be really great. Yeah, I'm honored to do that, actually. I will never let myself forget what that season of my life felt with, because I will tell you that on my worst days now, all I have to do is close my eyes to think back to then and everything comes into full focus. But that was the worst, that was the worst moment of my life. That 12, we'll call it a 12 to 16 week period of being on medical leave. I don't exactly remember how long it was, but I think it was from January 1st through maybe mid-March, I was full on medical leave. I wasn't allowed to work by law, wasn't allowed to look at my email, wasn't allowed to take work-related, you weren't allowed, you're, you, by law, you're not allowed to do any work, anything work-related or you'd lose your disability. Friends, or, or coworkers and colleagues stopped calling. To be honest with you, my marriage was a little rocky because my wife and I were, she was so concerned about me, but she didn't see me trying to help myself. She, all she saw was this guy who, whose life fell apart. And all I did was worry and look at Google and try, and I would literally spend days looking at symptoms and trying to marry symptoms through that I found through Google with health outcomes. Like I was trying to become my own doctor and just this perpetual mental cycle of, of worry and fear, worry and fear, worry and fear. I was having insomnia, panic attacks, depression, like you would not believe. I was, I've never been that depressed. I think I lost 30 pounds. I couldn't eat. My stomach was so upset because of the illness itself. And so what I started doing was just little bursts. I, I would call them little mini bursts. So on every day I would force myself to go outside and breathe in air and just, it was winter time. So I would sit in the sun, any sunny day, I would just force myself to go outside for a few minutes here and there to listen, to pray, to reflect. Then I'd go inside and I would do just five minutes of yoga on the mat, just little bits, a couple minutes here, just whatever I had the energy to do. And then I, then food, I would start like, okay, how could I nourish my body as best I could? So I would focus on food, meditation. I would just do any little thing I could. And most of the time I wouldn't feel any different. And then once in a while, I would feel a little more parasympathetic activation. I'd feel a little more calm, a little more centered, a little more reassured. And then there'd be certain days when, you know, and it's a little emotional for me to talk about, but there'd be certain days when a feeling beyond me would sweep over me that would say, you're going to be okay. Mm. You're going to be okay. This is, there is a, there is, there is, there is something for you in all of this and something beautiful is going to emerge. You have to trust that you have to trust. And I think looking back, I probably would have told myself one more time to trust. Cause I think in those worst moments, that's where the, that's where the beauty comes from. Yes. In hindsight, but in the moment fucking sucks it fucking sucks <laughs> <laughs> You're like, oh my god how long is this gonna be yeah i'm talking to you know someone i i get what you're saying for sure it, it, it fucking sucks so you didn't I, want... Want to, I didn't even i would force myself to journal i forced myself to read i didn't want to do anything i literally was so depressed i my wife and I were renting this really cool house on a horse farm at the time. So we had, we were renting this little carriage house in Pennsylvania, which is pretty common here. There's a lot of horse farms and I, we had a really cool landlord who's become a dear friend. And I remember he had a, this beautiful Percheron horse. I don't know if you've ever been around a, a whole, like a Percherons are massive, these massive beast like animals. And he had a horse named Chance. And I would go out, this is no kidding. I would go out and my daily ritual was to take Chance a carrot. And I would go out to the barn. It was middle of the winter, it was cold. So he'd be in the stall. He wasn't out on pasture. And I would fucking sit there and have a conversation with a horse as I fed him a carrot. Mm. And that horse, let me tell you, that horse taught me a lot. That horse, um, mm. that animal, the, the, the aura of that animal, 
And what he taught me on a day-to-day -day basis was profound. It's pretty mm. cool. Do you mind sharing some of those insights or lessons or teachings that you learned from the horse? It, he taught me that I wasn't alone, that there was some larger force at work surrounding me, holding me up. And he was just there to tell me it was all going to be okay. And to stay here, stay in this moment. There's beauty right here. You're here, you're living on this farm. You're living in this really cool house on this beautiful property. And there's a lot to be thankful for right here, right now. And this is your moment to slow your life down. So let, so let this moment, slow your life down, let it slow you down. Be here with me. I'm a horse. I'm hanging out. Like I can't go anywhere either. And <laughs> it, it's pretty good. Mm. And he's like, he just showed me how to see the beauty that was all around me. Mm. He also taught me something about strength too. There was a stoicism to that animal. He was just very strong and very, his presence was very powerful. Mm. And I think he gave me, he gave me that strength too. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. I love horses. Never own one or be around one long enough other than just horse riding experiences. But when I, whenever I'm near horses, I really appreciate, you know, just as you said, the magnificent beast that they are. So mm -hmm. can you share with us a little bit about, were you already on the spiritual path? Did you believe there's something greater than the, the soul, the spirit, or was it something that more of an intuition that there's something bigger mm -hmm. during mm -hmm. your dark moments? Mm -hmm. had, yes, I had absolutely been on the spiritual path for most of my adult life. Raised in a traditional Roman Catholic family. I went to Catholic school from first through 12th grade. None of that really resonated with me. However, I do think it created an amazing foundation to my spiritual formation. And then around late high school, early college years, I started exploring on my own. I'd say that my exploration took me first towards the Christian mystics. So I still related to that Christian narrative, the Judeo-Christian narrative, but a lot of the spiritual thinkers that I began reading and following were more of the, came more out of the mystical tradition where it was more about prayer and contemplation and meditation. Like I mentioned, Thomas Merton and Henry Now and Brendan Manning, Meister Eckhart, some of these thinkers really began to shape my worldview, which helped open my eyes to other religious or spiritual traditions, Buddhism and, and all, all forms of spirituality. So I had this really strong spiritual foundation. I've, I've been deeply connected to the Quaker tradition because of where I live here in Pennsylvania. There's a pretty big Quaker influence and the Quakers, if you don't know much about them are pretty, I, I pretty much call them the Christian Buddhists. Oh, um, they have this reputation of being very backward and antiquated, but they're mm -hmm. actually probably the most progressive Christian minds. Their form of worship is that you meet in community without clergy, without any paid clergy, mm. you sit in silence mm. as a group, as a community, you sit in silence for about an hour. And then mm. as you feel led, you can stand and share a teaching or a revelation. It's mm. a beautiful experience. Anyone can feel welcome going to a, a Quaker, they call it a Quaker meeting. So I had that sort of in my background, but I would say that this sort of dark night of the soul caused me to question everything. Mm. And I was definitely drawing a lot on God's spirit the Christ consciousness story, like all of these sort of ideas. I was so desperate that I was praying. I was praying to all beings. I was praying. I was like very broadly crying out to, for help. And th there's been, there was so many moments along that sort of dark night where I did feel 
the presence of a higher power that mm -hmm. was guiding me through it all, you know? Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for sharing in very deep and intimate moments. And it's so relatable. It's so necessary. And that's why I want to normalize people sharing their dark moments a little bit more publicly, because who knows? We would, by the way, when people do share their dark moments, a lot of times we hear back, Hey, I was actually thinking about doing the unthinkable, mm -hmm. but thanks for the story I'm going to do otherwise. Yeah. So, I'll actually, I'll share one more, one more detail. There was uh, one day in particular, so Lyme disease, it does, it usually when it becomes chronic, so uh, Lyme disease is totally healable if you catch it within the first couple of weeks. If you get bit by a tick and you see a bullseye and then you go to the doctor and the doctor gives you antibiotics, about 95%. Sorry, bullseye, you, you lost me on that. What's oh, sure. Yeah, you're from California. This isn't, so here on the East Coast, there's a lot of ticks. Mm -hmm. Lyme disease is very common, specifically in the Northeast. Mm -hmm. uh, although there are now confirmed cases in all 50 states. Mm -hmm. But normally what happens is you get bit usually by a tick, could be a spider, but there's other insects that carry the Lyme bacteria. Mm. And so you get bit and you end up with uh, this rash. And the rash is normal, normally like a circle and it looks like a bullseye. Mm. So that's like a classic telltale. Okay, that, this person has Lyme disease. Mm. Then the doc, then you go to the doctor and you get tested and then the testing is a little un, it's a little inaccurate. And so a lot of times people don't know if they really have it. So the doctor just gives them a two week cycle of antibiotics. And that's usually enough to just knock it out. Mm. In my case, I never found a bullseye. I never saw a tick on me and I fell mysteriously ill seven months later my doctor confirms, oh, it was Lyme disease. Mm. At that point, there's no antibiotic that's gonna work. Um, what happens because I wasn't treated right away, the first few months, it started affecting me neurologically. So it's very common that the Lyme disease attacks the brain mm -hmm. and it causes panic, it causes anxiety, it causes the inability to sleep, like insomnia. and. There was a day in particular where I was feeling so terrible and my wife was like, I just, let's get you out of the house. Let's just go for a ride in the car. And I remember I was like, my, I was having some of the most irrational thoughts that my, I, I never thought my brain was capable of having such irrational thoughts, but they were su certainly suicidal. And mm -hmm. I was thinking to myself, okay, maybe I should just ask my wife to drop me off at the hospital and leave me, just lock me up for a while just take me somewhere. And uh, I never spoke those words, but I was so close to just asking her. That's how dark it got. Yeah. I just couldn't, I couldn't pull myself out of it. Yeah. Uh, so thank you so much. As entrepreneur, especially as very ambitious, impact driven people. Mm -hmm. Oftentimes we do associate our self esteem along with what we accomplish, what we do. So we're going through this self-esteem roller coaster ride. Mm -hmm. And I think what you're sharing is even more fundamental, right? Because uh, it's, it's your health. It affects how you think. It affects your sleep. And we all know that if you don't sleep well, then it's a downward spiral right away. I really appreciate you sharing all, all of this. And then a quick recap. So during these moments, during this journey, what you're doing is go out, go out in the sun, pray, do minutes at a time, any kind of positive practices that you have as a way to bring back your own sovereignty in spite of all these physiological, environmental, relational, circumstantial impacts that has on your sovereignty. Is that an accurate reflection of what you said? That's absolutely correct. Yes. Yeah, that's it. Yep. It's like, how do you resource yourself from minute to minute in moments like that? Yeah. You know? So was it pretty much a solo journey or did you actually have additional community relational support? At that time, I, my wife was very close to me, although it was hard for her to relate. She was yeah. just there in the background. 
doing the best she could. And mm -hmm. in the end, this all brought us closer. I think our marriage ultimately became stronger over time, but that took, that took a couple of years to be honest with you. So yeah. she would admit that too. So at the time I was really, I had this realization pretty early on in that collapse that if I was going to pull myself out of it, it was up to me. It was my decision. No one was going to help me out of it. And so I just started resourcing myself however I could. Number one, I found a great doctor. Number two, and he's still my doctor today. Oh, I had great. A, yeah, yeah. And I had, I found a great psychotherapist who, oh, great. who I still see on a biweekly basis and cannot more highly recommend that experience of having a, someone, a therapist that you can really relate to and that you can really feel comfortable with. But to this day, my doctor and my therapist became my two advocates. Mm. And then um, thirdly, I actually worked with a third gentleman who I guess he would call himself more of a guide. Like he works with leaders. I, I guess it's okay to reveal who he works for an organization called Reboot. It's started by Jerry Kalana. So he's one of Jerry's coaches. And mm. I've known him from when I lived in Boulder. I knew this gentleman and he would meet with me over zoom while I was like literally in bed, we'd meet on the computer, like once a week, I'd have my laptop in bed and I'd be like feeling absolutely horrible. And, and Jim would just coach me and guide me. And like, he would walk me through the journey of hell that I was living and helped give me some guidance on how to learn from this place that I was in and eventually move beyond it. So yeah, Jim mm. was an amazing spiritual director to me during that time. So delineate on that point, just a little bit, because it sounds, well, it sounds like he's a, a mindset coach slash spiritual guy. How do you delineate the difference between a mindset coach, a spiritual guy for, for you personally? Yeah. So I was working with both a, a traditional psychotherapist and then Jim, who was more of this sort of leadership coach, if you will, I'd say that the, the psychotherapist is following more of a mental health. Okay. How can we literally help coach this guy back to mental wholeness, mm -hmm. back to physiological wholeness? Mm -hmm. and how can we help him overcome some of the trauma that he's facing versus Jim's approach, which was let's stay in the shit for a while mm -hmm. and let's be okay with that. Mm -hmm. And let's look at what's there. Let's look at what this moment of darkness wants to teach you about you. Mm -hmm. What's here for you now? Not so I had the psychotherapist who was like, okay, here's, let's get you to a better place. Mm -hmm. And then I had this other coach who was saying, let's stay here for a bit and really look hard at what's here. Because you, if you don't do that, you're going to miss a tremendous opportunity of healing and of awakening. Yeah. Yeah. It's hard to, the reason I'm emphasizing on the delineation is because a lot of what we talk about here on the podcast, it seems paradoxical. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to lean into your pain and discomfort? And and then how do you then aspire to be making more impact, more ambitious, mm -hmm. and be better, the quote unquote, the better version of ourselves, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's just paradoxical. Like why dwell in the past? Why, why talk about it? Why, why talk about the, <laughs> why normalizing this conversation? I want to move on to, 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 to the next thing, the better thing, the bigger thing, the faster, the better. Having gone through a few similar dark night of the soul moments of myself, my approach now, what I've learned is if you just patch it up and move on, the root is still there. Well, that's <laughs> what Jim would say. So, yeah. Jim, Jim would even say that he's, you keep asking the same question every week. I was like, what am I asking you? He goes, what are you asking? And I'd say, what am I going to get better? What am I going to get better? What am I going to get better? That was like this mantra I had. I would ask him every week, Jim, what am I going to get better? And he'd say, I don't know. When are you going to get better? And, and, and it was this idea of stop trying to get somewhere else. 
be here. This is the healing right here. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. And I also love the fact that, so in terms of relational, going back to my, the, my question is you put together a team of professionals mm -hmm. to help you yeah. get back on your path to healing and, and, and recovery. And yeah. so the way I would perhaps uh, use the metaphor is I treat myself as a high performance vehicle, F1 formula racing car. And who is in my pit crew? Yeah. Like who are the best physical, who, who are the best people who take care of my physicality, mentality, emotionality, spirituality, relationality, I'm um, all of it. Right. Wow. So, yes. Yeah. yeah. Yes. That's, that's exactly what I did. And I can add a couple people to that. Thank you for giving words to that because I'd never really thought about that. But then, so it was like a great doc, a great functional medicine doctor, a great psychotherapist, a great sort of spiritual coach. And then I had a great acupuncturist who, to this day, really helped me and she's still in my life. And, and I can go further down the list, but you're right. I assembled a team that ultimately coached me back to health, guided me. I want to ask you a follow-up question around there. So what are some of the criteria that you have regarding picking those people who is on your pit crew? And I ask this question specifically because in my mind, it's not just around their competencies, but there's something more. So I'm curious to know what your criteria is for you. Sure. Relatability, like someone who there, you just get a felt sense for, oh, I'm going to work well with this person because I like their energy or the way that they receive me or their compassion or their ability to listen and understand the suffering that I'm going through. So to me, it was more of a, rela a relatability factor. And then of course, ph philosophical alignment too. At that point, I knew what I didn't want, which was the traditional pharmaceutical approach was it, it didn't, there was no answers there for me. So I didn't want to find a doctor that was going to attempt to give me more answers with more drugs like that. That was a dead end game. Cause I had already seen that, by the way, I ended up taking that antidepressant. So when that, that final doctor visit, when he said, listen, all I can do for you is offer you this prescription medicine. I was so desperate and scared that I'm like, he's a doctor. He obviously knows. And if he thinks this is going to make me feel any better, I'll take it. So I got on that medicine and for me, it, that was one of the, <laughs> that was, that didn't help very much mm -hmm. it, it, in some ways. And I'm not, I don't want to go on your show here and, and profess that antidepressant medicine is. It didn't work somehow, for you personally. It didn't work for me personally. I would never, that's not a blanket statement. In fact, totally. if anything, I will praise the medicine if, if it made me feel better. It, in, in my case, it became a very difficult path to unwind that. I probably wouldn't have done anything different in hindsight, but I'm just saying what I knew in that moment was I didn't think the conventional medical path had any answers for me. So yeah. as part of my criteria, I wanted to find answers in a healthier, biologically driven way versus yeah. chemical driven way. Beautiful. Let's geek out just a little bit on the breath work part, if you don't mind, and then we can go into more of a, a bigger picture, bigger forward looking impact driven endeavors that you have. Is that cool? Cool. All right. Awesome. Thank you. So let's geek out on breath work a bit. So recently I came across a really interesting book called breath. Have you come across it? Oh, love that book. Okay. So. Would you what, consider right. yourself what they call a, a breath, breath knot? I think that's what it's called. Like people who really love to push the envelope around breath. Are you, um, just want to make sure we're talking about the same book. I think it's breath by James. James Nestor. Nestor. Yeah. James Nestor. Yeah. That's the yeah, book yeah. I read. Um, yeah. yeah, no, I wouldn't say that I am. I wouldn't call it, I'm pretty set in my pattern now. I'd say I found a modality that works for me. With all that said, I'm radically open. I think that there's a lot of different 
modalities and forms of breath work. And I'm, I'm still an explorer. So yeah, I guess I'm still on the, in the exploratory phase, but at the same time, I have a pretty regular practice that I do every day. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, because I came from a better macro engineering background. So I look at it more mechanically. Breath is oxygen in carbon dioxide out. Mm -hmm. How you do that actually doesn't matter. But the more I do it, the more surprising, super surprising. Wow, this is uh, very different than normal breathing behavior. And, and, and it's psychedelic almost, right? Yeah. And changes consciousness allowed me to open up and let go of some of the hidden psychosomatic trauma or stress or any kind of things that I took on, but couldn't let go of otherwise. So it's yeah. a very easy and very accessible to me. Breath work is awesome because it, you can't do psychedelics every day. It's just not a practical thing. And I wouldn't want that either because that becomes a dependency, but breath mm -hmm. is a, could be a regular practice and really, you know, excavate those uh, psychosomatic stress a little bit more easier every day. So totally. Yeah. Switch gear a bit, if you don't mind, unless you want to say something else about breath work. No, other than what I found for me is it became an evolution to meditation. So meditation no longer became enough for me. I had a very regular morning and evening meditation practice that was really just centered on letting go and emptying my brain, which I think has a place and, I, I, and it still has a place in my life maybe not on a daily, but on a as needed basis, I do meditation, but breath work I found had a psychosomatic reset outcome where it was spiritually invigorating. It was spiritually connecting. It was physiologically invigorating and it also mentally distressed me. So it accomplished a lot of different things for me. That's why I, put so much emphasis on breath work. It's a high leverage lever slash activity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Yeah. Single action, multiple outcomes. I get it. I, I understand you, man. I, I get it. <laughs> uh, cool. So I want to get into your life's work. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, it's about how do we title it? Elevate the connection between soil and soul. Mm -hmm. What you're up to is educating power of regenerative organic agriculture, as well as sharing the possibility of that to the general consumers. So people like me who may be intellectually aware, but not necessarily in practice actually doing anything about it. So I'm curious to know how can someone like me take steps towards that? Yeah, I think that the first and most essential step that every person can do right now to take steps towards that, towards deepening that connection is to get to know a farmer. I think that every single person on this planet should have a relationship with one being, one person who is growing food for us. We've become so disconnected, so divorced as a society from where our food comes from and how that food was produced, that I believe that is the single greatest reason for our human health collapse that we're facing. We are facing a human health collapse like never seen before in recent history, where chronic disease, cancer, autoimmune conditions, autism, obesity, ADD, ADHD, all these conditions are we're seeing dramatic inflection points at rates we've never seen in, in, in recent human history. And I think we've seen this march at the same time, that sort of rise in all of these chronic illnesses have run concurrent to our march away from connection to source, to where our food comes from and how it's produced. We live in a society of convenience. We live in a society of cheap food in, in uh, 1960. We were spending three times the amount on food of our US GDP 
than we are than we were on healthcare. So three times the amount on food than we were on healthcare. Today in 2020, we're spending twice as much on healthcare than we are on food. About 3.2 trillion of our gross domestic product is spent on healthcare than it is on food. And so ultimately what we're doing is we're still paying for it. We're just paying for it on the back end through, through uh, managing disease. And when I talk about this sort of march away from source and this disconnection, in 1945, during World War II, about 45% of all food purchased by US households was grown in our own backyard. So 45% of all food consumed was grown in our own backyards during the Victory Garden era during World War II. Today, about 18% of all the food we purchase comes from other countries. So we're now net importing about 18% of all of our food. And so we as a society have just become so convenienced that we don't even know where food comes from. We don't have a relationship with someone in our community yet, where you live in Orange County and where I live in Pennsylvania, I guarantee you that on a Saturday morning, there is some awesome farmer's market happening within a few miles of your home where you can literally go and have a conversation with the very person who's producing your food. And so, simply getting to know a farmer and building a relationship with farmer has the potential to dramatically alter your human health outcomes. So I'll make it personal rather than talking theoretical and the economic impact and ecological devastation and climate change. Because to me, those are way too far out. I can't relate to that on a personal basis. Theoretically, I get intellectually, I get right intergenerational impact, all of those things I get, but in on the personal lifestyle uh, choices wise, I'll just admit publicly, I like my convenience. I like Amazon Prime. I like to just you know push a button and things come to me. And I do care about price, of course. But at the same time, I'm also a biohacker. So I am aware of the uh, nutritional density importance. And ultimately for me, what I'm optimizing for is energetic optimization. How do I feel after I eat all my food, et cetera. Mm -hmm. However, there's a gap between what's available to me, as in mm -hmm. you're asking me to go out and talk to a farmer with uncertain mm -hmm. outcome. Like mm -hmm. in, again, intellectually, I get, I'm looking forward to having that conversation with the farmer, but I can just push a button and then food comes my way with the lowest sure. cost, highest convenience. So there's a little bit of a gap between, are there available resources where you can use AI or software to say, Hey, here's the optimization for nutritional density, cost and convenience. So then I can just point to me to say, go to this particular farmer, that particular market to get what you need. Cause I'm a, again, publicly admission, I'm a busy person. I'm not going to just visit yeah. this market just for the heck of it. Just sure. Accidentally yeah. find something awesome. You know what I mean? Yeah, I am. And, and at the same time, I'm not in any way suggesting you become some kind of a Luddite and stop your normal behaviors. That's not at all what I'm suggesting, but you do sure. take time for daily exercise. You do take time for yeah. daily meditation and movement and all these other yes. tools that you use. What I am suggesting is we have to begin to think of it in terms of concentric circles. I think there's sort of those degrees of separation that we all know, like how we've become separated. And now we need to think about degrees of reconnection. And so sure, not everyone has the ability to stop what they're doing on a day-to-day -day or a week-to-week -week basis and go visit a farm or a farmer's market. Or I even, want to. What I would challenge all of us to do is, okay, once a month, there is a spiritual practice. There is a, there is a self-realization and self-actualization that happens in the act of simply getting to know a farmer. So maybe once a month to say, okay, on this Saturday morning, I'm going to take a two hour block of time and I'm going to go visit this farmer's market and I'm going to stock up for the week or for the, for a couple of weeks. And I'm going to learn a little bit about how, how agriculture works. And I'm going to have real intimate conversations with these growers 
that are doing it right, that are growing food in a regenerative organic way. I'm, I want to carve out two hours a month to, or one hour a month to, in, to in, imbibe in that sort of process because it does something to you beyond the food itself. And of course, other day-to-day, moment-to-moment, sure, there's, there's all kinds of technology that's bubbling up that is allowing you to have really good food grown in really healthy soil delivered right to your door. So it's both. But all I'm suggesting is that as we begin to reconnect with agriculture, that we treat it as a spiritual practice, that we carve, carve out a, a, a discipline in our daily doing that would reconnect us to source. And if you can't go to a farmer's market, then maybe the next concentric circle is once a week, you're gonna go to an independent grocery store where that grocery store is very hyper-focused on local food. And you begin to cut down on these degrees of separation. And it's not to say you don't stop shopping at Amazon or Whole Foods, but it's starting to add in these new rituals that begin over time to change you. Does that make sense? It does. I so th- thank you for breaking it down for 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 us this bond <laughs> uh, around all of this, and it, I think it circles back nicely to how we started even this conversation when we talk about aura rings. Mm-hmm. I'm not saying to use technology for the sake of just a supple, just automate all of my decisions, but it does make things a little bit more accessible. And same mm-hmm. thing with media. What we're doing here, we're producing media in such a way that hey i really relate to that jeff guy let me try on some of the things that he suggests i really relate to that ck guy you know right his whole journey around being a technologist to now a uh, spiritualist to now you know in my mind the way i would articulate me would be an integrationalist so you actually look at things holistically rather than just uh, one thing over the other so I'm curious because you have, you were the managing director of a, a publishing company and a slash what's by the way. Okay, great. So your title officially is chief impact officer, big title. I, I love that too, by the way, how, how does it feel to have that kind of a chief impact officer title? Well, yeah, I need to differentiate. So in 2016, after I fell ill. I had always been around Rodale Incorporated working there, but then J.I. Rodale, our founder, he started a nonprofit called the Rodale Institute, and that's where I I work today. I had been invited to serve on the board of directors of the Rodale Institute in 2015, and after spending one year on the board, I fell more and more in love with this work. I began to feel a calling to the work, a spiritual calling. And through that descent into my sickness and being on medical leave and that whole season ultimately led me to ask some big questions about what did I really want to do with the rest of my life? And I knew, like, I knew in my heart of hearts that media and publishing was not my longing. It wasn't my heart's ambition any longer. And I had seen the work of Rodale Institute, which was this nonprofit that was focused on science around helping farmers to adopt these regenerative organic practices. It was a global nonprofit, but under marketed, under, it, it wasn't realizing its full potential. And so when I began to feel a little better and I got back to work at the publishing company, I had some conversations with some other board members. And I said, I think I want to leave what I'm doing in order to go work with the Rodale Institute full time. And so everyone was very supportive of that because the Institute was about to embark on a new frontier and and a real, we call ourselves a 70 year old startup. And so I became the chief impact officer, actually made up my own title because in my work here at Rodale Institute, we don't measure our success on profits. We measure our success on impact. And so yeah. my job is to make sure I maximize the impact of the organization. Yeah, I asked that question specifically because you're effectively, your title is to help change people's behavior. You're leading a movement towards regenerative right. organic agriculture. Rodell itself is a 70 year old startup is being leading that movement from organic to now regenerative. And then you're also very well versed 
in media. So, and now you're getting into the technology because in my mind, those two are very scalable levers, media and technology. So I'm curious to know, as you think about leading this movement as a chief impact officer, or as a very dedicated, this is your dharmic path. How do you leverage these two very powerful modalities as a way to empower and shift the massive, the awareness towards yeah. regenerative organic agriculture? Sure. Yeah. And regenerative organic agriculture as a, as an idea can be esoteric to a lot of people. It's, mm -hmm. but at the same time, it's foundational to all life. And mm -hmm. what we found, and so we've been around for 70 years. Okay. We've been primarily an organization driven by science and driven and led by scientists. And so therefore the organization has been unwavering in its mission for seven decades, but we've been undervaluing the brand. We've been undervaluing the story that we hold in it. And we've been under marketing ourselves. And so our job is really to help grow the global influence of the brand of Rodale Institute. And if we can do that, if we can grow our awareness, then more and more consumers can begin to embrace this idea for themselves. They can begin to put pressure on big food companies and on farmers ultimately to begin producing food in a more regenerative organic way, which is which we found through our science does mitigate and sequester carbon. It does reverse the effects of climate change. It cleans up our planet and the people consuming the food get healthier. In regenerative organic agriculture, everything in the system gets better and better over time. So we're ultimately trying to lead a movement that would drive consumer demand for food that's produced in a regenerative organic way. And by so doing, big industry will follow. So we're trying to really tell our story. We're amplifying it through media and technology. And it's been amazing to be able to borrow from my media toolbox, if you will, to be able to apply that thinking here to this nonprofit. I don't know if you guys are already doing this, but one of the things that's really obvious is, is to have essentially like a podcast network or something that focuses various areas of the story that you're trying to tell. Cause for me, I'm an avid, a podcaster, but I'm also a podcast listener as well. I would love to hear more stories, inspiring stories about, let's say how food heals one's body, your story, or how it impacts our longevity, how it impacts soil and farming, how it impacts a harmony with nature, how it connects to climate change ultimately. So a variety a number of angles I would love to consume at personally. I don't know if you, if that's already in the pipeline, but that's. Something. Yeah. Yeah. We've been this year, uh, my team and I have put a major emphasis on just getting us on more podcasts and it has had a profound impact on our brand, on the kinds of people we're attracting to our work. And I myself have had the humble privilege of going on shows like yours to tell our story, but every time we get to tell our story, the phone rings, the emails come in. We were just featured on a movie uh, called Kiss the Ground. If you haven't watched that movie yet, a uh, great movie. We were featured in that movie and about a week after the movie came out, I was out at Rodale Institute on a Saturday morning doing something and I ran into this father and son who were touring our facility, our global headquarters. And I started a conversation with them. I asked them what they were doing, where they were from. And they said, well, we're here for a tour. We were uh, watching the movie Kiss the Ground last night. And by the way, we live in Chicago, Illinois. And uh, we watched the movie around 4.30 in the afternoon. And I, I said to my dad, hey, dad, I'm off from work for three days. Why don't we get in the car and drive to Rodale? So they drove 14 hours through the night just That's to tour. Awesome. Yeah. Wow. So it just goes to show the power of media to amplify this transformational work that we're doing, right? So maybe one may venture to say there may be a documentary in the pipe <laughs> as well at some point. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I think we're really focused right now on earned media because we're a, we're in startup mode, so we don't have these we don't have robust media budgets. So we're relying on 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 people like you that have audiences to help tell our story and get the word out. So. Thank you for this opportunity to come on of your show. Course, of course.
I'll, I'll throw out a, a little bit of a, a wish list your way. This is something that I, I want personally. So I would love to maybe have a, a 90 day protocol to follow such that, mm -hmm. Hey, here's the steps you can do to improve your body, improve your longevity. You may not see it right now, right away, but ultimately we've done our research is actually good for you in the long term. And the reason I say that, because again, food is something that I consume. I immediately receive some kind of gratification of satiation, taste, etc. But the long-term impact of longevity, health, and everything that you had just talked about through your own story, I don't see it yet. Yeah. And if there's a protocol that shows the, tra the trajectory easily, I'll totally do it because I don't want to do the research, frankly yeah. speaking. Yeah. You know, yeah. To, let, me to learn that. let me respond to that because you said something earlier when you were talking about your, in, your biohacking inpatient life that you mm -hmm. and I live. Mm -hmm. We at Rodale Institute, we run long-term studies. We actually house the longest running side-by-side -side comparison of organic and conventional grain crops in the world. So it's this 40 year study where we've been, we have a 12 acre 72 plot study where we literally have plots of like conventionally grown corn, genetically modified corn that's sprayed with Roundup and all kinds of other chemicals grown directly next to these regenerative organic plots of corn and other grains. And that's one study. And what we found in that one study, I, it would take me a while to unpack, but it's profound and you can read more on our website. But then we just started a new study a couple of years ago called the Vegetable Systems Trial. And this is the first study of its kind in the world where we're growing vegetables that you and I would purchase at the grocery store. Some of them are, some of the plots are managed using synthetic chem chemicals, pesticides, herbicides. And some of the plots are grown in a regenerative organic way. And, we're, and this is the first time we've taken land at the Rodale Institute and transitioned it from organic to conventional. So we're actually degrading the health of the soil over time. We're about three years into the study. And what we're ultimately trying to do through this study is answer the question, is organic food truly healthier and more nutrient dense for me? Is it really? Because no one's ever proved that. And so through this study, Rodale is is looking at that and we we just got some data back from our third year and we found where we actually send off all of our samples to a third party verified lab that uses very sophisticated equipment and imaging technology and this laboratory found one 26 different phytonutrients in the organic produce that came out of the study 26 phytonutrients so this isn't macronutrients this is like phytonutrients, like the littlest stuff that makes you and I healthy on a, ma on a micro level, 26 micro phytonutrients that exist at levels 100 to 700 times higher in the organic produce than in our conventional produce. And that's only after three years. And the reason we commit to such long-term studies at Rodale Institute is because biological processes take a long time to unfold. They don't happen in nine months. They don't happen in, they happen in nine years. You can't rush biology. And I know we are all trying to biohack our way to better health, but you can't force the soil to do something it's not designed to do. So I think that there is something to be learned there for all of us that if we truly want to be the healthiest, most self-actualized humans, we do need to slow down. We do need to take time for our nourishment, for our food. And sure, there's convenient ways to have that delivered to our home and to maximize that, but healthy food grown in healthy soil does take time. And maybe that's worth slowing down a little bit for. Yeah, for sure. I think you quoted the founder of Rodell, healthy food. Healthy, healthy. soil? Healthy food equals healthy people. That was J.I. Rodo's his, his original mission statement, his original thesis for our work. He wrote these words on a chalkboard in May of 1942. And this has been the guiding light to our work ever since. Yeah, uh, I really love that. His ideas are popping in my head because you guys are already doing the research. In my mind, as an entrepreneur, I think about, hey, if you want to educate the 
the the public to the convert images as well send them or sell them kits hey for your home garden do this and just easy step one two three and then you can experience yeah. it yourself da, da, da. so that way it's very sustainable you're educating them at the same time it's not just some you know esoteric theoretical thing they're actually experiencing and then the more they care about their garden the more they will care about the mission the yeah. movement they take on so yeah um any last thoughts before we complete our i know that you're you have a one o'clock, so I want to be respectful of your time. Oh, uh, yeah. Complete. Thank you. Yeah, I think we're standing at a moment in human history where this is the greatest and most important work of our time, in my opinion. And I say that because there is, we, we, I think the year in which we're, we find ourselves has exposed a lot of frailties to a lot of our systems our supply chains became massively disrupted this spring when the pandemic hit and we saw grocery shelves laid bare because of our reliance on imported food. We saw, we were seeing human health epidemics at proportions we've never seen before. The COVID crisis in and of itself, we're, the United States has some of the highest mortality rates, I believe. And I think a lot of it has to do with the current state of health in this country. So we've exposed a lot of frailties. That doesn't even touch on climate and all of the perils that we're facing societally right now because of the way we treat the earth. But I found myself speaking at a virtual conference this past September for the United Nations. They mm -hmm. have their, their global day of action and I was honored to be given an opportunity to speak there. And the United Nations has its 17 um, SDGs, the sustainability goals. And as I was preparing my speech, I went one by one through each one of those 17 goals. And I found that regenerative organic agriculture could actually be the solution to 15 out of the 17 goals set forth by the United Nations. If we took all of our farmland in this country alone and began to transition it to this new way of producing food without the reliance of pesticides or herbicides, working with biology instead of chemistry, we could heal all of the world's greatest problems simply by changing the way we farm. And I, I know that you and I are talking here this week, post-election, um, we're literally the, the week after the election and the earth seems to be just exhaling a little bit. And yet there's this, there, there is still a divide that remains. I happen to live um, in Pennsylvania where historically we've been a red state. And we in, in Pennsylvania, they say, was the one of the catalysts to flipping the election. But yet this divide remains. And that hurts me inside. And I wonder if, is it possible that food and agriculture could become the thing that unites us all? Because mm -hmm. at the end of the day, we all eat three times a day. And if we all can unite around a better way of producing food in this country, everything could get better. And so I think I would just end with those thoughts and that idea. Yeah, for sure. Dude, I can talk to you for hours. <laughs> Let's do it again. For sure. I absolutely. I'm so looking forward to our next one. Let me take a moment to just acknowledge you, Jeff. And thank you so much for just being here, generously sharing your time mm -hmm. that you can never get back. You're right with me, with my audience and sharing your story, sharing your struggle and sharing the vision and sharing the path of what's possible if we actually pay attention to how we grow our food because that is a fundamental building block as you said earlier we all eat three times a day yeah. and the quality of our life really depends on the quality of food that we take in mm -hmm. we want a greater quality of life greater and aspiration greater vision self-actualization the food itself literally is the fuel that allows us to reach, you know, the highest of heights. So thank you so much for just really talk about beautifully this vision on behalf of Rodale Institute. I really am, am inspired to learn more about what you guys are up to. And I would do better, you know, in terms of going out and talking to a farmer's market farmers and, and take on these new practices. Thank you so much for being on the show. Awesome.
Yeah, it's a real honor to be here. Thank you so much for this opportunity. I too very much enjoyed our conversation and thank you for the beautiful work you're doing in the world too, to help shed light on all these powerful leaders and powerful ideas.